All right, and we are live. So excited. So, um, this is my first time going live. <laughs> oh, awesome. That's right. <laughs> I mean, I think I watched another YouTube video with you or a podcast or something. Yes, maybe, but maybe not live. So it's a whole new. A whole game. new ball game. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so guys, let us know in the chat if the audio is good and if you can see us. And we'll get started. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin. I'm very excited to learn even more from you. We've had several chats um, and yeah, already you mentioned things that I had no idea about. So um, for everyone watching, Kevin uh, Twohey has over 15 years of experience in the design industry with over seven years of experience as a freelancer. And he has worked in-house at a consumer facing company. He has also done a brief stint at an agency. Um, and he's worked at really awesome companies like Mirror, Vice, Gagosian, uh, Everlane and Casper. So we're very excited to have him here today. And uh, Kevin is here to help us demystify freelancing because uh, in your words, it's the best job that you've ever had. So just to get started, um, can you tell us how you became a designer and how you got into freelancing? Yes, so um, my, my path into design and, and the world of software in general is a little sort of a little sideways. So I, in college I was studying math and computer science. And so I got into software in general from, from an engineering lens. And just, I was never really that serious of an engineer, just sort of like writing little programs and screwing around with software that way. And um, I ended up working on a startup in college. And, and the reason I was working with the startup was mainly because I was kind of the target market. They were, they were targeting college students. And so I was giving, you know, user feedback and sort of collating user feedback and trying to give that perspective. And so from that, I got to work with their product people, um, even though I didn't, you know, I didn't really know very well what I was doing, but I was writing little kind of like feature specs, mostly in, in narrative prose. And from that engineering point of view, thinking like, how would this be built from an engineering perspective? So yeah. I started doing that. And, and um, at some point on that job, and I remember this so vividly, um, one of the product, I had written some sort of spec for a possible feature and the product person said, you know, can you map this out in a little bit more detail? And mm -hmm. I remember being so confused by that question because I thought I had mapped it out in as much, you know, sort of like in a very nerd engineer way, like this is exactly how it works. <laughs> I don't know how it could be more detailed. And they meant, can you draw a picture of the UI? Right. And I didn't know that that was a job. I had never, I had never thought too deeply about how that stuff got made. And so when that right. clicked, you know, that moment sort of changed my life. And, and that's how I got into design in general. Awesome. Um, and what was the process like for like getting into freelancing? Yeah. So I did, you know, I, I worked on that startup uh, during and after college. I worked at a few more um, early stage consumer facing startups do, being, you know, a junior designer really like focused on UX and wireframe kind of like inching my way into the more visual side of things. Right. Um, and I, I did a brief stint in the agency world, um, which I knew sort of right away was not for me. And I mean, a big agency world, like multinational agency. And okay. it was just a little, um, too removed, it was too abstract and too removed from the actual process of, of making software, right? Like you, there's mm -hmm. a big handoff at the end. And in, in those days, like we were working in InDesign and I, we were handing off a PDF, you know, and then maybe two years later, something would come out or maybe it wouldn't. So that wasn't for me, but I, I learned a lot about the process of sort of selling design and creating a yeah. narrative around like a broad vision and I really enjoyed that. So I sort of stuck around to learn that. And then in terms of getting into freelancing, I initially started freelancing um, because I, I had sort of a bad, ex I had a, a, a suboptimal experience with a full-time startup that I joined. And yeah. I just felt like 
you know, you interview and you meet these people and you, you talk to them and you ask all these questions, but you never really know until you're in there and working with folks, you, you don't know what it's going to be like. And I felt like right. uh, if I had just done a project with these people, I would have known, you know, they're perfectly nice people, but it's not a good fit for me. And I mm. thought maybe freelancing would be a great way to try to sort of, you know, try before you buy. And that's how I first started doing it. And essentially I, I really quickly realized, you know, this is, I, I love the arrangement and the setup and it's the part of the process of creating technology products, the beginning part that I love so much. And I sort of thought if I want to give it a go at trying to do only that for, right. for a while. And, and, you know, that's kind of what you get good at, right. Is, is what you do over and over. And I wanted to get good at starting up and that's sort of how I got, got started freelancing. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so what was the process like when you started to set up your business? So I kind of think of it in, in roughly three phases. So the, the, that first chunk that I was telling you about where I was just sort of dipping my toe in and trying it out, right. I didn't do much in terms of setting up the business really like very low overhead. I was, you know, a, a sole proprietor. So I didn't mm -hmm. have a company or anything like that. And I was really just dipping my toe in the water. Once I kind of got a little more serious and realized, okay, maybe I would, I would like to really do this for longer, you know, maybe for, for years, a couple mm -hmm. of years. Um, the second phase of getting a little more buttoned up and operationally serious. So, and we can get into the, the details of the, the nitty gritty of this stuff more later if we want, but, right. you know, setting up an LLC. So I set up an LLC it's taxed as an S corp and I can get into the details of that and when it makes sense or not um, yeah. setting up QuickBooks, running payroll, I have an accountant, all of that stuff was kind of part of this second chunk of taking the business a little more seriously and getting buttoned up operationally. And I did that. Um, I think it's good if you can to sort of take things one step at a time, since you can be, you can be a freelancer and do almost nothing operationally and just be a sole proprietor. So you don't need to do everything all in one go and it can be a bit right. overwhelming. So it's nice if you can say this month, I want to do the LLC, then I'm going to figure out QuickBooks, then I'm going to figure out my accountant. You can sort of spread it out. And then the last sort of last and current phase is, is sort of my, the setup that I have now, which is, you know, at some point a few years ago, I, I decided, you know, if um, unless anything substantially changes and you never know where your life's going to go. But from my current seat, I would love to do what I'm doing now forever. And I could see doing that for my whole career. And so trying to think a little more about how do I set this up? So it has some longevity and um, I get a little bit of kind of balance and stability. So most of the operational stuff is the same, but in terms of staff, you know, I have, I mostly work on my own, but I have one full-time designer on staff that works mm -hmm. on all the projects that I'm on. And I have a part-time assistant that does some administrative stuff like uh, invoicing and, and things like that. And that kind of help is, you know, I still mostly operate as a principal designer. It's not an agency, but having that level of help makes it feel a lot less um, overwhelming. Right. Yeah, I can imagine that doing all of that would be really overwhelming for someone just getting started. Um, how long of a time period did that happen over that transition from sole proprietor to LLC? The, my first chunk of freelancing where I, before I set up a business was a couple of years, um, two, maybe two and a half years. And then I set up the the business about five six years ago and then it's been in the last sort of two years where I've kind of gotten more serious about just how can I shape not just the you know not QuickBooks and not payroll mm -hmm. and not invoicing time tracking stuff but more how can I shift the way that I work and my relationship to the work in a way that makes it feel sustainable for you know 10 years or or, or more yeah that's great um so going into freelancing, how did you try to position yourself uh, for success? And do, do you have a specialization? Yeah, so there was definitely an arc of sort of, you know, first early on figuring out the, the right zone and the right type of work that I felt I was best at and, I, and that I could, um, where I could do my best work. So 
um, where the vast majority of my clients now are um, founders who are starting new consumer technology businesses. So mm-hmm. you know, what it says on my website is zero to one product design and strategy. So it, what does that mean in practice? Essentially, um, it means I'm usually the only design resource and I'm starting from scratch, meaning there's, there's nothing in place in terms of a brand or a product. Usually there's something like some kind of like deranged Google doc or notion or something where, you know, there's some really smart person. They have all these ideas and they're kind of you know, yeah. putting together, but nothing in terms right. of design. And that's where I start. And usually, I don't know if folks have heard of this kind of like double diamond design process mm-hmm. where there's sort of, you know, this first phase where you go wide and sometimes it's labeled like build the right thing. So figure out what to make. And that's really right. divergent and it involves a lot of research and iterating and hopefully you lock onto something that you have a high degree of confidence in and, and, and you agree to move forward with. And then there's this kind of like second divergent phase that's build the thing right, meaning can we execute to um, a high degree of success on the actual design and engineering of the thing that we wanted to make. So it's essentially providing all of the design support to go through those iterative loops and then set the client up for long-term success, which usually means helping them find like a full-time design resource to take over my work once they, uh, you know, once they've launched. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, So I want to talk a little bit about clients. So how did you first gain a client base? So this is one of the, the most common questions I get about freelancing or the more general question is how do you get clients? And to me, the really only true answer for that, for the type of work that I do is through referrals. And I can talk mm-hmm. about referrals later, but the question then is like, okay, well, that's great, but I don't have any referrals. So how do I yeah. start and how do I get clients to begin with? And so mm-hmm. the thing with referrals is that it just, there is a na- no matter how hard you work at it, there's a natural half-life of time that it takes for that kind of referral network to kick in. And mm-hmm. maybe it could be, you know, anywhere from, eight months to 16 months, right? Before that starts okay. working for you. Before then, um, there's a few things and it might kind of depend on the nature of the work. Like I do, for me, I do um, freelance product design for consumer technology products. So there's a pretty specific mm-hmm. set of places where you can find and, and go um, talk to people who need that type of service, like whether it's online or in certain other networks. But if you yeah. do, you know, if you do iconography or you do illustration, it might be a little different, but I would think of it in, in a couple of phases. First, just your prefer- personal slash professional network, the people that you know already. Some folks are lucky to have better networks than others in, in the area that they're trying to penetrate, but everyone, you know, there are, there's gotta be someone in your network that has a need or knows was one degree away from someone who has a need. So just try to be visible to those people, even if it's just, drafting an email saying, Hey, I just wanted to let you know, this is what I'm doing now. I'm doing freelance work. Here's my website. Here's the type of, of uh, projects I'm looking to take on. I think it can feel a little stressful to do that, but yeah. if you don't let people know, they're not going to know. So that's even just directly. And if you can get one or two leads from that, that's fantastic. And kind of get the referral network going in the category of um, the stuff you can do online You know, there are the marketplaces like Upwork and things like that. I think it could make sense for, you know, a pretty specific um, type of design work. And it's, it's not something I recommend in the long term, but if it's just to get started and get a couple things in your portfolio and a couple Mm -hmm. clients that can vouch for you, it can work. And then the other thing I would say is just cold outreach is that's something that I did a lot when I was first starting out. Um, find companies that you would like to work for or that you think need the thing that you do and send them an email, find the email address of whether it's like the CEO or the marketing person or the social person, whoever it is, and send them some type of thoughtful email that includes, you know, a slice of the type of the work you do. Maybe you only spend 40 minutes on it, but those things only need to pay off. Maybe you only need one in 10 of them to pay off for it to really be worth the time. So I think those are some ways to start to, to kickstart things. And oh, and one I forgot, sorry, I know I'm going kind of like off the rails, but (laughs) um, agencies. So I know I said I worked for an agency and it wasn't for me, but um, 
you know, that was a huge multinational corporation and there are tons of really amazing small boutique agencies um, that do amazing work and are mm-hmm. constantly in need of freelance folks. Like they staff up a project and they don't have an illustrator or they don't have a product designer. Oh, they interesting. They need someone, you know, to bring in for like this six week chunk and yeah. you don't have to take a new job, right? You just, and, and the agency will handle all the billing. They'll handle the client that, you know, it'll be really straightforward. And I know a lot of freelance folks that kind of dip in and out of their own clients and that agency world that can be a great way to start um, getting things moving. And, you know, maybe you make a relationship with the client and you work with them directly down the road. Yeah, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, Okay, great. So be visible and reach out actively, especially when you're first getting started. Yeah. Um, So what types of clients might you have as a freelancer? Um, I can speak, I think it's really going to depend by sort of industry and specialty. I can speak for me personally, there has kind of been an evolution. It tracks a little bit to the discussion we were just having about, you know, how do you get started and the types of clients you take on? And in the beginning, Mm -hmm. it's going to be, you know, whoever will have you, whoever will pay you. Right. So maybe you call that, um, type zero, which is it's whatever you can get to start out. And then. After that, sort of graduating to what I would call type one clients, and I've sort of come up with this scheme. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but type one clients, meaning it's more of the form, um, you're, you're, you, the freelancer, are a technician, meaning you're doing what you're told, more or less. And maybe you okay. bring some of your own like craft and intelligence to it, but that, in my world, that would be, um, we need an app, and it should be it should be like Venmo and there are seven mm-hmm. screens and, and on each of these on screen one, there goes A, B, C in this order. And uh, it should look like this. And can you mock okay. that up for us? Yeah. And really executing. Very execution oriented. And maybe you, maybe you're bringing your, your unique lens or your, your unique craft to it around the margins, but you're really being paid to do um, a hands-on skill. And mm-hmm you know, a huge chunk of the work that I've done in my career is of that type. And I really enjoy doing it. So um, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think doing enough of that type of work and building intuition and experience and muscle memory um, starts to get you into a position to get this other type of client, which would be, you know, just following my weird numbering scheme would be like a type two client, which would be um, yes, you're doing that hands-on work, but you're really getting paid for, that experience and judgment and what's in your brain because you've done so much of that type one work. Maybe you've done that Mm -hmm. Venmo app 10 times and you can, and you can lend your either, you can do it incredibly quickly, or you can lend your unique special knowledge that you have um, from doing it so many times. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, a goal is to get to that type of client where you're being paid for your, your expertise and what's in your brain, because um, that's sort of how to get out of the commoditized nature of certain uh, freelance work. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and how do you choose your clients, especially now that you're successful? Um, so, yeah, I, I mentioned kind of the type of client I generally work with usually tends to be in that shape where it's um, a founder just starting out. Usually they have some type of kind of genius or or superpower in some area like they're they're starting Mm -hmm. a business because they're really good at some other thing sometimes it's the business vertical that they're starting like they're starting a fitness business and they know everything about fitness but they don't know so much about technology or design um you and, and you know other attributes of the type of work that i tend to focus on you know by its nature it's iterative and sort of loopy so it's hard to know from the beginning exactly where we'll end up Mm -hmm. um and then I, for me, within that category, as long as those boxes are checked, I kind of just go on personal interest. And is this something, you know, am I going to learn something from this? And that can either be the domain. So like one of my, my longtime clients is, is an art gallery. And I knew, I knew nothing about the world of fine art yeah. really before working with them. And um, that's a whole sort of world of experience and getting to be a, a fly on the wall in those discussions is just a really enriching, interesting experience. I would pay to do it. So um, am I going to learn something? Sometimes it's an individual, like I feel like this client, I could really learn something from him or her. And Mm -hmm. that could be a reason. 
And I think there's also just a general, um, again, with all of those boxes checked, you want to make sure, am I going to enjoy working with this person? Like when the phone rings or I like click the little Google calendar thing to bring them up on zoom, am I going to feel a sense of dread or am I going to feel excitement to get them on the phone? And I think that you can build that intuition pretty quickly and you want to work with people who are, you know, where there's a mutual admiration and respect and, and they give you energy. Right. Exactly. I think um, even when I was looking at my new opportunity, I uh, paid a lot of attention to who I'd be working with and also, yeah, exactly what I would learn. Like if there was a company where I had already done something similar, then I was just less interested by nature because I wanted to learn new things. Yeah. Um, And that's just, I mean, one thing I would say about freelance in general that to me is so fantastic is getting to make those decisions with a lot more frequencies, you know, yeah. who do I want to work with? What do I want to work on? What is the mode of my work? Maybe I want to go a little more into the visual conceptual side of things, or I'm really interested in kind of like brushing up on marketing. Um, in, you know, a, a traditional career path, you may get a moment to make those choices like once every couple of years, maybe. Mm-hmm. And so being able to have these built in moments every few months, or for some people, you know, their projects are weeks long, um, where you can just adjust very granularly and frequently. What do I want to be doing? Who do I want to be working with? That to me is a huge benefit of of doing consulting work. Yeah. It sounds like there's less chance that you would get kind of pigeonholed into one thing. Yes. uh, I think so. There are some people who I think Um, it's sort of their goal. Like they have a really specific type of work they want to do. And in that case, Mm -hmm. the pigeonhole could, could be great. Right. If they're like, I do iconography for healthcare companies on the East coast, you can be (laughs) the one person for that. Um, but yeah, if your orientation is a little more like, I want to go like this and I want to be divergent and what I'm learning, then yeah, yes, it can really help avoid like uh, I'm in my fourth year at this company and there's a lot of great things about it, but it's just not what I want to be doing. But I also don't want to quit my job. You, know, yeah. you have a lot of good reasons why that's not a, a great you know, option. For sure. And do you collaborate with your clients in a particular way? Yes. In, I would, two things. In general, I would say my, my philosophy is to try to not um, be too prescriptive and too religious about any, you know, specific way of working just because I try to treat all of my clients like I'm on their team and Mm in-house and I would never join a company and walk in and say, well, here's how we're going to work now. It's just not how I would want, want, um, the engagement to go. So that's my general orientation, but how I set things up by default is that, you know, everyone's remote now, but I've always sort of been, mostly remote. I set up um, one standing meeting a week with all of my clients and make an agenda for that. And there's usually some one-off meetings here and there for, you know, maybe we're meeting with an outside partner, or maybe we need to like have a big divergent brainstorm on something. But Mm -hmm. it's um, usually, I think if we make a good enough plan up front about what we're trying to get done, it can be fairly um, drama-free not a lot of meetings, a lot of asynchronous work. A lot of times I go away for like five days and then send a big loom update. Like I'm back. Here's mm-hmm. what I've come up with. Um, yeah. So that, and yeah, but in general, in terms of the tone and the tenor, I try, I really try to not, I know I just said I go away for five days, but I try to treat <laughs> the client like I'm on their team. Yeah. And with, that usually means not a lot of overhead and sort of big reveals. And if there, if something goes wrong or I'm, you know, confused, or I think we've made the wrong choice, you know, don't let that fester. Just tell them immediately like you would if they were your coworker. Right. Yeah. And that's kind of how I like to think about it. Yeah. Great. It, I mean, it, yeah, it's great to be part of the team. So I can imagine that if I were freelancing, that's probably something I would miss, but then it sounds like you have those same interactions still. Yeah, for me, I mean, that's one, again, it's different for everyone. And the specific type of work that I do by its nature tends to take a while. So, you know, my engagements might be, maybe the shortest one would be a few months. And, you know, my longest running client is four years now and counting. So 
for those people, I've known them longer than, you know, a lot of my friends and I've, I've definitely spent way more time with them. So for a year long engagement, especially if you have that orientation to it, these people really feel like your teammates. So Mm -hmm. that's one of the things I like about doing this style of work is just longer engagements and embedding deeply with the team. So you get, you know, you can have as much or as little of that team feeling as you want as a, you know, an individual. Yeah. Nice. Good to know. And, um, I think like, I'm sure there are times when things, uh, or, you know, not a match exactly. So uh, when should you fire a client? Yes, I think the general thing I would say about this is if you know it's not right and you know it's not working and it's not serving either person, I think you can end the relationship if it's, if it's just not working for you for personal reasons or, or you think, the, you know, you're not set up for success, but especially mm-hmm. if I think in a lot of setups, you just have this feeling it's not working for them. It's not working for me, but we still signed up for this whole thing. And I feel a lot of angst about letting people down. And I just think yeah. if, if you treat, approach those, uh, assume the other person's probably sensing what you're sensing, approach it like um, a professional and just say, it, you know, it feels like this is probably not working for either of us. And maybe we could get um, potentially there's a chance to course correct, but maybe the best thing is just to end the relationship before it ends, you know, on worse, on worse terms. There's even, mm-hmm. um, it doesn't need to be thought of as firing a client, but there's also just natural times when, um, you part nothing, ways kind of exactly the, the, nothing is going wrong. It's just the relationship has evolved and it has reached its useful end. And I've, I mm-hmm. learned kind of, um, it took me a while to learn. You think naively, well, a client that runs for three years, that's amazing. That's the dream. And why would you ever do anything to, to jeopardize that? But it's like, a, you know, it's like a good party. Like you want to leave when the party is good. You don't want to leave when things get weird. So just have a sense <laughs> of when things are about to get weird and just know, hey, look, we've done so much amazing work together, but I think the right thing is maybe for you to bring this in house or maybe for... Mm-hmm me to refer someone else to work with you. Yeah. Um, we have a bunch of great questions coming in. So we'll definitely get to those uh, at the end. Um, so keep them coming. It's great. Cool. And uh, okay, so going into some of the projects that you work on, um, what kind of projects are you looking for? Uh, I spoke to it a little bit before, but in general, those type of zero to one consumer facing product design um, engagements. I do also kind of layer in, it's nice to have some balance and Mm -hmm. it is nice to sometimes, um, you know, sometimes you can learn about what you should do when starting out from getting exposure to things that are already big and working. So probably Mm -hmm. once a year, I take on a project that's with a larger company. Like I, I wrapped up this year-long project with the New York Times uh, mm-hmm. recently. That's not a startup. That, you know, it's a fairly established yeah. technology company. But, um, you know, and from those, you you pick up, it's a nice um, counterpoint to being sort of solo all the time and having to figure out everything yourself. You sort of see, like, mm-hmm. how, how do they run meetings? How do they do QA? How do they think about how to, like, t- um, get executive buy-in for product work? So... I, you know, I like to look for those two types of projects kind of in, in balance. Yeah. I think it would also be really like interesting to be a fly on the wall and kind of see how all these different companies are operating. Yeah. Um, I love, I mean, both just in terms of the industry, like I said, you can dive into the art world. I had a client that was a big bakery. So learn, you know, just learning yeah. about industries, but also, um, yeah, pick, it's an amazing trick to be able to pick something up to, to learn something from one client and say, oh, wow, I never, I've never seen that done. That's amazing. And then go take it to another client and say, Hey, check out this thing I learned. I can teach it to you now, like the next week. And, you know, that's amazing. So I think the rate of, I remember for my first job, my first, you, you have your first in-house job and you think, okay, there's one way to do everything. And I've now learned it. And then yeah. you go to another job and you feel like, okay, there are now two ways to do things. And it takes a while, I think, to realize like there's, there is no one true way and you, you can constantly be picking things up, you know, on, on the job. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so 
when it comes to figuring out like how many projects you can take on at a time, for example, how do you go about estimating? So I think it's two kind of two things together. So estimating projects in general, um, that's a whole topic. Figuring out how mm -hmm. much you can take on, I sort of think, I don't have any great advice other than you're probably going to figure it out by getting it wrong and overloading yourself. That's everyone Trial and I, error. I know and talk to has gone through that path of um, I took on too much. So that's how you'll know. And um, you <laughs> yeah. can kind of course correct from there. In terms of estimating, there's a whole sort of topic of estimating and pricing, and maybe we'll get into pricing a, a sure. little more specifically yeah. in a bit. But in terms of estimation, um, I've never really done fixed bid or fixed time projects ever in my mm -hmm. career, really. And, and most of the reason is just because like the type of work I described, it's fundamentally exploratory and the nature of it is that we don't really know when we when we start out what we're going to make or what direction it's going to take and that's kind of a good thing so yeah you it's hard to estimate it too closely and it, it can actually be bad to estimate it too closely and I think a, a lot of good clients would be suspicious of someone who said oh you you want to start a new consumer business in this area it costs fifty thousand dollars and you're sort of like well how do you know so yeah um I never have, have um, estimated that way, but essentially I started out, uh, we can get into the details of billing, but I started out pricing hourly. A lot of people start out that way. Um, mm -hmm. The way that I work now is on a flat weekly retainer and it's, an, it's the same for all my clients. And it's a nice balance of, um, you know, getting out of the problems of charging hourly, but without needing to do fixed bid estimation. And so yeah. it's, it's essentially that flat weekly retainer. And then the thing that I do on top of that, you know, clients, they're going to need to know, well, how much is this going to cost roughly in terms of an order of magnitude? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, they want to estimate both time and budget. So with that, I help us both together come to an estimate of based on projects I've done in the past, based on what I know, I think this is probably going to take on the order of, say, eight months to do. And here's how we're mm -hmm. going to break it, break it out. And uh, sometimes those are very accurate. Sometimes we figure out something in month four and we go on a, on a long journey together and it takes twice that amount of time and, and that's okay. But I, we yeah. sort of constantly are evolving the roadmap. So they have a rough sense of total cost, but it's a flat weekly retainer. And part of the reason I really like that model is that it really puts the onus on the client to make sure you have what you need to right. do your job because mm -hmm. we're going to be working together every single week for the next, you know, you know, N weeks. And if they um, have a block on their end, it's really in their interest to get it unblocked as opposed to, you know, other setups. Yeah. Um, do you ever get any pushback when you, you know, name your price with potential clients? Yes, sometimes. And I would say, you know, we'll get into maybe the details of pricing, but just to say this one yeah. thing is I think everyone should charge more with almost <laughs> very few exceptions. And almost everyone I, I talk to, I, I give that advice to. And I really think mm -hmm. um, the vast majority of freelancers are undercharging. And one, one general sort of way to know is that you probably should, if you're charging, you know, a good fair market rate for what you do for your clients you should probably be hearing that's too expensive or why does it cost that much frequently so you know maybe a good middle so that's the be, goal yeah you're losing yeah. maybe half of your projects to cost or maybe a third okay like you're hearing get, getting really comfortable with hearing it and then a yeah. lot of times you know i think it takes a lot of practice to talk about money and to justify mm -hmm. your rate confidently. And I literally would practice it, like practice answering the question, like I have done this. Mm -hmm. Practice answering, whoa, uh, that's not what I thought it was gonna cost. Why is it so expensive? Mm -hmm. And just coming up with a confident answer to that, that you believe. And yeah. so many times um, that's the end of the discussion. Like, right, okay. They just wanna Great. hear it justified and okay, that was convincing. Uh, mm -hmm. sometimes it's not. And they say, okay, well, I could never pay that. And then, uh, then it's not a good fit. And perhaps you can yeah. recommend someone for them to work on, to work with. Right. Exactly. Um, 
Okay, good to know. And in terms of justifying it, does it usually just go back to like your prior experience on projects and the time estimation? Or I, I guess you don't gonna, estimate time exactly. Yeah, it's going to be different for everyone. I think um, in the case of early stage product work, the, the decisions that you make up front in the beginning of a company, in the beginning of a technology product, there's almost no more consequential decision, set of decisions you can make because mm -hmm. everything is sort of evolutionary from there. So right. the first, you know, the first one or two or three people you bring in to forming that company and the set of design decisions that they help you make is worth spending money on. And, uh, you know, I think everyone has gone, everyone understands the notion of, you know, a meal that costs three times as much as some other meal somewhere else. And they yeah. understand why that is. And so I think if, you know, talking to clients and saying, this is what I think it's worth. It's also just very practically, it's one of the reasons I would not advise to charge hourly. It's a lot easier if you can break out of comparisons of hourly rates. Well, hey, why are you charging 160? I see this other designer, they're charging 40. Why is that? Mm. So yeah. it can be a lot easier if you break out of that scheme. Okay, that's great. Um, so what are some of the su success criteria that you have? Um, I would say in general, most of my, the goal of most of my projects are to end with a launched product in the field that is showing early signs of working. Mm -hmm. um, it's not... Uh, it's, it's almost never fully working because it's sort of a V1 or a V1.1 where we figured out, okay, here's, here's the core of what um, is, is successful and here, here are the things we need to tweak. Um, mm -hmm. Generally, I have by that time set up the client for like long-term success by hiring a head of design or a full-time design lead. So that to inherit the work and that overlaps with me for some period of time. So they're sort of off to the races and that ends yeah. up being superior than even in some cases hiring that person in the beginning or, or mm -hmm. sometimes it's impossible to do that. Right. Um, so those are some of the things. And the last thing, you know, that is something I learned to ask my clients up front. I have a little survey that I do when I kick off engagements. And one of the questions, you may think you know by talking to them, but it's good to just ask very explicitly, what is the most successful outcome we could possibly have of working together? And then I also ask, what's the worst thing that could happen? So mm -hmm. like, what is the thing that you're afraid of that how this working together might go wrong? And those, it's not always what you think or could predict. Uh, and then the other, the other one that I ask that is usually really instructive is basically who is responsible for the success of this project overall, not just the design, obviously that's me, but literally the company, the product, you know, is it you, the designer, is it me, the client, or is it us mm -hmm. together? In my work, it's yeah. almost always us together, but sometimes you get an answer to that and you say, whoa, okay, I guess we weren't lined up. Mm. Okay, interesting. Uh, you went into this a little bit, but how do you set your rates? So um, like I said, in terms of structure, I charge a flat weekly retainer. Um, generally my projects are you know, months long, sometimes years long. And yeah. I would say in order to, the general principle is to figure out something reasonable and then keep raising your rates until you feel like you're sort of have a really healthy relationship with the market rate. And you, know, you can decide for yourself, do I wanna be right at it or right below it? Or should I feel like I should be at the top of the market? But so how to, yeah. how to estimate a good starting point, I would say you can kind of use a few benchmarks. So um, if you can find other freelancers and get them to tell you what they charge, that's fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. Agency rates is another one. Like what would an agency charge to get this done? And you can bracket from there. Is um, that comparable? It's, I think it's analogous, right? You wouldn't okay. charge the same, but you could bracket from there down to, well, okay, what me as a solo person with less overhead. Um, right. But it is, you know, one way to think about it is, can I charge as much as a big agency? Uh, that seems crazy. But from the point of view of the client that needs something done, if you can get it done for them and you can solve the need for them and they can move on, 
it may be reasonable that it costs what an agency could could charge them. And if it's going to be less of a headache or less overhead and they really enjoy working with you, isn't it reasonable that it would charge a similar amount? So, yeah. um, you know, that's one way to bracket. And then the one of the easier ways is just full-time salaries. There's a lot more information out there on this. Like even on your YouTube, you, you've talked about yeah. this and, and, you know, openness around, around salaries. So you can get a good bracket on what do companies pay a full-time person to do what I do. And mm -hmm. then you can kind of math out from there, what would a, an equivalent hourly rate be and an equivalent weekly rate, just with the caveat that you need to take into account the overhead, right? And there's tons of good stuff out there um, online about this. There's a book by Dan Mall called Pricing, Pricing Design. I think it's literally called Pricing mm -hmm. Design. It's really short and good. Uh, but you, okay. you need to take into account your overhead, right? Like insurance, your office, your uh, paid vacation for yourself, accounting, but you can tack that on top of the full-time salary and back into like a starting rate and raise it from there. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to note that book down for later. Uh, so we've gone into this a little bit um, in our previous discussions, but what are the possibilities uh, with equity as a freelancer? Yeah, so... I, one of the things I said up front, or I can't re remember if I said it uh, in this conversation, but I've never, and in the book I just mentioned, he'll talk mm -hmm. about this, but value based pricing, right? So charging, not based on like what it takes you to do an hour of design work, but on the value that you're giving to the business that they're going to mm -hmm. realize by the work that you do. So there's a whole yeah. kind of school of thought on that. M it never has been a great fit for my work for the reasons I already said, because it's fundamentally exploratory and how am I going to put a value on this when we don't even know what we're doing at the start. Um, but taking um, equity in your clients, if they're technology companies is a great way to sort of um, capture the value of the work you're doing in another way. So mm -hmm. I've only started doing this in the past, in the past several years. And it took me a while to kind of work up the, confidence and intuition around it. But, um, you know, I, it, I take equity in not all, but some of the projects that I take on. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, and I use my kind of own judgment and intuition to figure out when that might be a good idea. And what I would say is just practically, I think there's a lot of conventional wisdom that, you know, only employees can get equity and contractors can't get it or, oh, well, we just raised our series A round. So we can't, we can't do that. It's going to be um, too annoying with our lawyers. In my experience, it's almost never true. If they want to work with you, there are ways to do like a one-off grant that's fully vested, or they can say, hey, we're going to work together for eight months or 10 months and we'll invest 10% every month. There's all mm -hmm. kinds of creative ways that I've structured it. Um, other last thing I would say on that is you don't need to decide this upfront you can say, and you can, um, if you don't want equity in the company and they offer equity in exchange for services, you should say, no, I don't do that. I take, I want cash for my services. Um, yeah. But if you do want it, you can also start an engagement and make that decision halfway in and bring it up yourself mm -hmm. and say, oh, hey, you know, now I've been working with these people for several months. I really think it's interesting. And hey, I would like to give you um, I I'm interested in talking about an equity cash split and they'll probably be happy to hear that. Yeah. So it's, you don't need to decide up front. And in a few months after working with people, you'll have a much clearer view on whether it might be a, a good idea. Right. I think that's really great to know because it could like the value that you get from having equity in addition to your normal salary can be massive, especially if you're at like a public company where you just get it right away after one year and then every month after. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, it could be a deterrent, even if you know, like, as a freelancer, you potentially wouldn't get equity. Exactly. That's kind of, I totally agree. And um, it is one of the kind of few, if you were to list on in two columns, like, what are the things you can get in a, in a full time in house career versus freelance, getting equity right. upside is one of kind of like the last, not the last things, but it's one of the things that people feel like, oh yeah, there's really not a good way around that. And so it's a night, if you can swing that, it's a nice way to hedge against what you would get going to work full time, uh, you know, at a tech company. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you uh, touched on this a little bit, but what are the advantages and disadvantages of freelancing? 
So advantages, I mean, I think there are a lot of advantages. Like I said, it's, I can't say enough good things about having a freelance career. And I, and I really want more people to see that as like a viable, mm-hmm. visible career path. Um, for me, um, things like autonomy, having control of your own time, um, flexibility and variety. So kind of what I said before about these moments in your career where you get to steer a little bit left or right or, yeah. or totally off center. I want to go do something crazy for a month, especially if you have two or three clients at a time, you can kind of spend one of those chunks of bandwidth on something you've never done before. You want to go design book covers for a year. Mm-hmm. So it just gives you like a really granular rudder on where you're going as an individual and where you want to grow and learn. To me, that's the biggest thing yeah. is that um, I think that in a, in a traditional full-time career path, it, they, those steering moments can some, they can be great if you like go to a new company and you get a big promotion uh, or you land your dream job, but they always feel like incredibly stressful to ponder. Right. And so I think mm-hmm. in, in a freelance setup, having those be as frequent as possible and driven by your needs and desire, not like what's going on in the corporate structure at the, the, your employer. I think that's yeah. the, the biggest one. And yeah, that's kind of my favorite thing about the freelance setup. Okay. Do you ever have trouble switching context between projects? Yes, I do sometimes. And uh, it can just be a little bit of information overload. But then again, you know, I think everyone who's a, in uh, design or technology engineering work at one of these companies is feeling a bit of information overload. Um, yeah, true. The context switching, yeah, can, can be a lot, but there's something... I really think there's something nice about it and keeping the brain sort of plastic and, um, you know, the, these, the projects I'm working on sometimes are so divergent and different. Like at some point last year, I was working for the art gallery, which is very sort of like austere and precise. And I was also working on this app for kids, which is like, I was, you know, drawing watermelons for some reason and switching between those two. It's just kind of sometimes nice. Your brain lands back on something and you think, huh, what about this? So yeah. yes, there's a cost and a benefit to it. Mm-hmm. Any major disadvantages? Um, I would, there are some that I hear a lot. And if you can work your way out of them, I, I think all of them have a solution, but here are some that can be a disadvantage. For certain mm-hmm. types of work that are, is, that are less kind of like stable and chunky, um, that are more kind of gig oriented. There's the classic like feast or famine cycle where you don't really control what comes in. So you may yeah. have a couple of months where you have way too much work you could possibly do. You're stressed out. And then, you know, the summer comes in, nothing comes in. And what are you supposed to do about that? So mm-hmm. um, my work doesn't really have that, um, that exact type of shape, but that is a challenge for people who's, um, if your average project is shorter and you have a little less control over when and how they come in. So that's, that's a big one. Um, yeah. And just what goes with that is just kind of stability. And, um, you know, I should say, I uh, don't have any dependents. I don't have kids. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm lucky enough to be able to pay for my own insurance, though it is like very expensive and useless. So it, another topic. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're very well may be folks for whom um, making that leap is just not from a life stability point of view is, is tricky. So, yeah. and then I, I would say just your type of personality, like um, if you know, or you think that you're someone that thrives in like high ambiguity environments and really likes driving yourself, if you're an intrinsic motivator, it could be good. Mm-hmm. If, you, if those things are not true for you and you think you're an extrinsic motivator, uh, it might not be a great fit or me, may, or maybe okay. an independent, like a small studio could be great if you kind of need a little group to, you know, get you going. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, is there anything that you give up by working in-house for a company? <laughs> to me, it's a, it's sort of the inverse of some of the things I listed. Um, you know, you give up full autonomy over your own time. Um, 
I never really loved the idea of people putting time on my calendar, like taking without asking, like taking an hour from me. It never mm -hmm. felt right. And I always hated that. And, um, you know, so that is a choice and it's, it's a, a totally fine way to work, but I think it's, you know, it's great if you can see that as a choice and a trade-off, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing to do. It's just, you should get compensated for giving up your, uh, your flexibility and autonomy of your own time. And I know there are probably plenty right. of like really lovely places to work where that doesn't happen, but um, I think that's the biggest one. And just, um, you know, the, the thing about those like little moments where you can steer your career, I think you give that up a little bit. And you also just give, there's something I love about things having a nice natural ending. Not everything needs to go on forever. Maybe you mm -hmm. do great work and you move on from it. And um, full-time jobs, I wish they had better like natural endings built in where it was sort of like yeah. you both got something great out of this and it's time to move on. Yeah. Um, so I just think people should, uh, it's, it's no... Um, absolute about good or bad, but just know, uh, make an informed choice about what you give to your employer versus what, how they compensate you. Right. Okay. Uh, and you, so is there anyone who shouldn't go into freelancing? Uh, sort of like what I was saying about intrinsic, extrinsic motivation and ambiguity. I mean, I, I watched your interview with Rasmus and when you mm -hmm. were both talking about the IC uh, manager tracks. I think there's right. something kind of parallel with that, where um, if you are one of those people who are listening to that interview and saying like, oh yeah, I, I really, I'm on the management track that like working with people, setting them up for success. Um, that gives me energy and excitement. And of course I love the IC work too, but I think that's what I'm going to mm -hmm. be best at. It may be that, um, independent solo freelancing is less of a good fit for you but you could also yeah. be independent the analogy I would think is the IC track is a solo freelancer in the independent world and mm -hmm. starting a small studio could be if you really are getting energy from working with people and setting up projects and setting them up for success and uh, mentoring people like starting a little studio could be a great you know alternative where you get to do that and work with clients you know getting that same energy right yeah and uh, we spoke about this uh, briefly earlier, but um, what do you think about people who want to become a freelancer and then start their own agency from that? Any advice there? The main thing I would say is if you can do it in that exact order, be a solo person and um, then try out being a duo, see how that goes and see how you like, mm -hmm. the, you know, for me, bringing on my first full-time designer, it's a night and day difference. It's, it's fantastic and I love it, but it's so different mm -hmm. than working alone. Uh, and then a trio is similar, like the relationship and dynamics between three people and, and how it changes the relationship to the work and project management and um, utilization, right? Like, okay, this month is coming up and uh, John or Jane doesn't have a project lined up. I better go get one. It's a totally yeah. uh, different vibe. So doing it in, in that order, as opposed to, I'm going to start from scratch. I'm going to give my agency a name. I'm going to buy a fancy sign. We're going to rent a place in Soho. And then you sort of feel like, okay, did I go a little uh, too hard on that? And <laughs> so I think just doing it in a natural iterative way and growing in, I think for a lot of people, they're actually like born to do it. And, and they're mm -hmm. fantastic at running um, small, medium agencies. And I think just working into that is the best way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So we went through all of our questions. So now I'm actually going to go through the chat. Um, if you have questions, feel free to continue adding them. Let me see. Uh, Tasman, what's the general lifespan of a project before you pass it on? Yeah, I think in general for me, uh, it's months. So it would be odd for me to have a project that was only two months. So maybe mm -hmm. the shortest would be something like six months you know, to get something from scratch into a working product. Um, the longest, like I said, I've been working with one of my clients for over four years. You know, that product has been in the market for years. Um, av you know, if there was an average for me, it's probably about a year or a little under that. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, and so someone else uh, says that they have they were a freelance content writer and they switched to UX UI design in 2020, um, but they tried uh, Fiverr and Upwork didn't work for them. Let me see here. They decided to leave the platform a few months ago um, and ask what advice do you have for them as a starter? One thing I would say, I actually know a couple other people that have gone that route from being a copywriter or content writer into UX. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a really fantastic path. I, I know I said I was a math and English major. I mean, a math and computer science major. I was also briefly an English major. Uh, you know, it was complicated, but um, yeah. the ability to write clearly and to think through uh, prose and content is such an underutilized skill. And if you can teach yourself to draw wireframes and kind of get an, an edge in that way, like, mm -hmm. I, I would love to hire a UX designer that had a content or a writing background. So I would say yeah. keep, keep going. But I would say maybe the application of those like marketplace services, your writing and uh, sort of prose lens is probably not being appreciated. And right. valued those people are looking for the they're looking for the wireframes or the mock-ups that's it yeah and so you can find someone maybe i would skip over that type zero and go to the type one if you can send some cold emails to people who you know have both needs the writing and and the ux and say here's what i do i have this unique blend that's what i would do yeah awesome okay so positioning yourself that way and reaching out to people right awesome um, how to be more creative in the field. I'm great with creating designs, but mostly it is quite a bit inspired by something they've seen in the past. I would say no problem. That's uh, how everyone gets started. And it's partially what clients are paying you to do is to have, be looking at this stuff and have a point of view and be able to pull out and say, oh, you know what? you know what might be a good reference? I saw this thing on Pinterest or whatever and pull it in. So it can feel like you're doing it wrong, but I would say there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's how I started out. It took me probably, I would say 10 years to feel like I developed any type of unique graphic design sensibility of my own. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. doing like, I was in wireframe land for many years. Then I was in exactly what this person is saying, just copy things that you see and try to mimic them land. And you can apply right. that very successfully. There, there are, there's a reason there are graphic design paradigms and trends. Uh, and then eventually the only answer is just to keep doing it and you'll, you'll find your own visual sense Style. and identity. It will just come naturally, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think repetition is really key. Um, maybe also just, you know, uh, when you're working for a company, there are very few opportunities, I think, to be really creative, especially when you have a design system. Um, but what could be nice is doing a side project. Yes, totally. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. So if you don't have an outlet at your full-time job, whether that's like doing things on, on weekends or just doing little graphic design experiments um, yeah. is great. Okay, another question from Tasman. How do you convince clients to trust in your process, especially when startups are generally run by founders with very strong opinions and little patience? Yeah, okay. I, she knows what's going on. Um, yeah. I think a lot of it just comes from experience and um, having done it before. So it's really useful when, once you have built up even a, a small track record of clients, say three mm -hmm. that you've worked with and, and they, you build a trust through the work. So you've already worked with them and you've delivered for them and they can mm -hmm. vouch for you. So it's very powerful to be able to say, um, also, you know, here's how I work and here's what I can do for you. And you can contact any of my clients, please. I don't even need to introduce you. I'm happy to, if you want, but just ask them. And if yeah. you do good work and you've convinced people in the past, that is like a really powerful statement. Um, mm -hmm. that this person is worth trusting up front. So I, I think that's one way. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, yeah, with, with freelancing, it's really nice to have like those other clients uh, in your pocket to kind of verify, you know, that you perform well. Um, when you're in a more full-time job, I guess like a lot of this just goes back to the data, 
you know, so like verifying, like mentioning user research or that you have hot jar that shows something or analytics. Um, right. So yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Let me see yeah, totally. here. Um, and that's a good point. Like what you brought up, there are also more practical measures of success that you often see in sort of like portfolios and case studies, like you mentioned, like here was the conversion rate when I started this project, here was revenue, here's where we ended up. So if you have those, yeah. that's fantastic too. Right. I think sometimes it can also kind of be just like an intuition thing where in your gut, you feel that this is the right decision, but then those become a lot harder to justify, uh, you know, to who, whoever it is involved, whoever the stakeholder is. Yeah, totally. Uh, another question, favorite client engagement and why? Um, it's impossible to pick a favorite, but uh, one that just comes to mind, I really enjoyed it. This project that I worked on um, for kids is this company mm -hmm. called Hellosaurus and they make, the product is essentially like an interactive Sesame Street. So there are these shows and, you know, like in Blue's Clues where they would say, and can you find uh, the pineapple? And there's just dead air because they're waiting for the kid to be involved. And um, right. it's essentially software that allows the kid to be a little more actively involved. And I just loved working with that founder and, and working with people who have a lot of expertise around children's psychology and learning and education. And it was just fun to also, at that time I was working on three projects that were strictly black and white. And mm. I just felt like it was fun to be a little creative and, and also learn about designing for children. So that was yeah. really, really interesting. I've never done any designs for children. Yeah. yeah that's one thing you learn quickly is they can't read. So any interface yeah. copy is totally useless. And it's like a really, I mean, it's, it's really interesting to, to experiment with. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, I was going to make a joke that that could also be applicable to adults because like, <laughs> I think the amount of people that actually read your copy is very little. Um, so I think the key is to kind of keep it short. Yeah. Um, so how does a complete beginner break into the field? Uh, do they have to work for free to gain experience? They don't have to, no. And I know there's, you know, there's many arguments about this topic yeah. and everyone can decide what makes sense for them. But I would say no. And I think those... Um, platforms like uh, Upwork and such, they are not good long-term. Actually, you know, some people do build great long-term careers on there for certain types of things, but I would not recommend them for the long-term, but they're great places to start out and you don't need to work for free uh, on there. So mm -hmm. um, I think that that's, a, you know, an okay place to start to try to build up some reps and build up, you know, a couple of successful client engagements. Yeah. Awesome. Well, those are all the questions that we have. Thank you so much for joining me. I learned a ton from this, so I hope that everyone else did too. And uh, yeah, again, thanks thanks so much for joining me. Yes, I'm going thank to you. end the stream. I really enjoyed it too. Thanks everyone. Anyone can DM me or email me if you have any questions. I'm always happy to hear from people. Yeah, you can find Kevin on Twitter. Is there anywhere else that you'd like to be contacted? or Twitter and my website is the same. It's just myname.com. Okay, perfect. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.